All right, looks like we are live. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the flip side of the coin. We've been talking about for the last couple of installments about Simonides and what he did or claimed to have done in the production of Sinaiticus which is claimed to be a 4th century document, I believe. Um, but he claimed that he made it in the 1800s. And so that's very, very significant because Sinaiticus is the whole reason why your modern translations are in alignment with the Vatican Codex and the reason why Protestants started taking the Vatican manuscript seriously. Desiderius Erasmus believed that it had been derived from the Latin Vulgate, that it was written after Jerome wrote his Latin Vulgate. He believed it was heavily influenced from the Latin Vulgate. And today, they try to pass off Vaticanus or Manuscript B as a 4th century document, along with Sinaiticus, which I do not believe is true, based on a lot of different evidences that I've been seeing and the inadequacy that I have seen to argue against these um, these claims that Simonides made, and etc. So, if you guys can think of anybody who may be interested in this live stream... You guys can go ahead and share it. I'm hoping this will um, turn out well as a recording. The first couple of uh, recordings that we've done have been a little bit rough. Oh, good. I'm glad I, that you can hear me. Um, and a shout out to Spray Arm um, as our second donor, Glenn, from the British Isles, was our first. I appreciate both of your guys' generosity very very much it's just amazing to i don't know it's just amazing to think of how far we've come and how it seems like we're trying to start over again kind of that's how i feel sometimes trying to get the inspiration back, trying to keep the ball rolling with these weekly live streams, and I'm um, hoping to do more eventually. So, let me see. Maybe I can share this in... By the way, if you have not had the chance, I don't know who's going to be watching this or not, Um. I'm going to try to keep this one shorter if I can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share this live stream with our Friends of Gale Ripplinger group. If you're not a part of it already, I have about 25 people that need to be let in. Um, join us live. Of course, I type love. L-I-V-E. Cool. Of course, um, let's see now. They, they are going to be let in very shortly. As soon as I can get a spare second, hopefully tonight, um, to get these people let into uh, the Friends of Gail Ripplinger group. Um, I also found out just a few days ago that Stephen Avery, who I've heard a lot about um, as far as researching this topic, he apparently lives not a half an hour from my house, I think. So I'm looking forward to hopefully meeting him at some point. Um, David Daniels mentioned him as, a, uh, as somebody who has looked more into something I'll be bringing up about. Constantine Tischendorf here in a bit, which is pretty interesting. So definitely, what what I plan to do with this live stream is escalate it. I want it to go from 
you know, what's going on with Tischendorf's story to, oh, you mean nobody believes Tischendorf's story? Not even the people that write about him today believe in Tischendorf's story and that it's unlikely and that he probably lied about the discovery of Sinaiticus and all these other things. And, oh, you mean uh, they're using the Sinaiticus on purpose? Oh, you mean a famous esoteric philosopher, Manly P. Hall, recommended this manuscript? Oh, you mean somebody that channeled demons that spoke through their mouth, and these demons are recommending Vaticanus and Sinaiticus as the most accurate manuscripts of the Bible? Oh, interesting. So... We're going to get into all of this. Like I said, if you can think of anybody that you know, friends of yours that would want to listen to this live stream, then um, you can share that with them. And I'm going to also share this to our Bible version conspiracy group. And King James Visual Artists, if you're an artist, feel free to pop on over to King James Visual Artists. And you guys can jump in there um, if you do anything with visual art. It's kind of a collection of people for basically a resource for the artists and um, some, you know, a place they can bounce ideas off of, um, meet other artists that believe the King James Bible. And people that need artists can find artists there um, that believe the King James Bible. Check out their art, get connected, stuff like that. So head on over there for that. And if you're not part of the Friends of Gail Ripplinger group, feel free to jump in there as well. Um, I will approve you if you answer the three questions correctly that are listed correctly and honestly as you join. Um, and I believe the link is still down in the description of this video for Gail Ripplinger's thank box card for Mother's Day. And it looks like from what I'm seeing on my phone that this video is pretty blurry. Hmm, I'll have to work on that. So I'm also going to try to get a couple of cords for this live stream set up. So hopefully this will start working out a little more smoothly. A little more consistently be able to stream. Well, thank you, Spray Arm, for inviting four or five folks. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. All righty, get rid of my keyboard. And we'll get into this. I've been devouring a lot of David W. Daniel stuff the past uh, few days because he's done a lot of research into this whole uh, Sinaiticus thing. And um, as regarding Tischendorf, as regarding Simonides. Wow. I tell you what, he's, he's dug up some stuff. He, he is a digger. Like he likes to refer to himself as he's a wonk. He really is. He's a, he's a total complete nerd and they love it. So, for the person who just joined, we're going to be talking about Tischendorf and the discovering of Sinaiticus and the possibility that Sinaiticus is not the strong possibility that Sinaiticus is not any older than the 1300s and that it was possibly written by a modern Greek in the 1800s, which would affect textual criticism all the way through, if it is true. Absolutely crazy stuff. And I really appreciate David Daniels' one, one video where he actually goes through several different key points that limit the, uh, um, the age of uh, Sinaiticus to... Uh, only, only it can only be as old as the 1300s, 
with these with these different points they're they're just like wow actually that's that's pretty interesting um so yeah this stuff gets crazy and i started listening to i'm probably going to do a reaction video to it at some point maybe in the future um or maybe uh what would be really cool is get um David Daniels on this stream and um listen through his um his video with him. Ooh, and then bring James White into it, right? Just have him on the other end and be like, let them fight, you know. <laughs> oh, that'd be hilarious. Oh, and you guys know I've done some stuff with the Mandela effect. And there may be people listening tonight or to this uh, video that are into the Mandela effect thing. I don't try to deny that they're not seeing anything and that there's not something going on. I, I'm not going to try to deny that. But when it comes to the Bible, especially, what's her name? Cat Martin? She uh, goes way out, in my opinion. Her her um, ideas about how the Bible has changed are totally whacked out, and uh, I think completely scripturally ignorant. If you uh, took out the things that she would recommend or the things that she thinks are added, you would not have much Bible left. So she's doing a live stream tonight, I believe, about... Um, uh, the God of Poop or something like this, um, talking about uh, Beelzebub, I think. And I think what she's, I, my theory is that she's going to be going um, to the Old Testament where it talks about them not calling God Baal, something or other anymore. And she'll just be like, Oh, can you believe that they're calling God Baal? That's uh, Beelzebub. That's the Lord of the Flies. That's, that's calling God the God of of uh, plot of poop and calling him Satan and don't read the King James Bible and stuff like this. Something like that is almost my guarantee. It is, it's, it's, it is crazy in, in her world. Absolutely crazy. In fact, you're not a Christian if you believe that, or, or if you sing the songs that say that Christ died on a tree, or if you even believe that verse in the Bible where it talks about Christ dying on a hung on a tree by the Jews and the Romans. If you believe that, you are not a Christian. If you don't see that, you're not a Christian. It's like, and it's like, she she thinks that that verse is talking about Christ hanging from a tree, like on a rope. And it's just uh, too frustrating. Once, once this channel takes off, and if I'm able to, you know, get it, get the ball rolling and keep it rolling by itself, once this channel is self-sustaining and i'm used to it and everything and um it becomes more of a success if i do start another channel i would love to do one that rips that stuff into little tiny pieces and um explores the phenomena of the mandela effect a little bit more thoroughly anyhow let's move on to One of David Daniels' videos. Do, 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 do. Now, I don't, for, for the sake of the stream, until we get the Ethernet cord and we get the, um, until I get the Ethernet cord and the adapter so it hooks up to the laptop then I'm probably going to wait for actually showing video in this video because it just gets it gets too skippy and erratic and weird. Yes, the dung god. I'll watch that later at some point, I guess. Oh, let's see. Something funny about Sinaiticus is the playlist. If you guys want to check out this video after this video, 
um, or any other point you can. It is the uh, something funny about Sinaiticus playlist. I think I have the link down in the description. It's on the uh, Chick Tracks official YouTube channel. There are 38 videos in the playlist as of this date. And it looks like the latest one is from seven. No, the latest one is from one year ago. Why wait to read others' research is the last video on the timeline or on the uh, video list. I would also recommend checking out David Daniels' um, oh, the Sinaiticus timeline is a really good one too. Okay. First one I wanted to bring in is Who Darkened Sinaiticus? Waste precious time managing anxiety and depression with breathing techniques, countless hours of counseling. And okay. As I'm about to show you, we know historically that the document called the Sinaiticus was changed. You can't get around it. Something that was snow white became dark and stained all throughout 694 pages. Okay, so what he's talking about in this video is the color of the Sinaiticus's pages. He contests, and um, he's going to show how it started out white, and then at a certain point in time, you guys can check out the cover of of uh, um, uh, is the world's oldest Bible a fake? His one book, and he shows all of the pages of Sinaiticus, and you'll see two strips in there that are white pages. Um, and it's very important also to remember for later on in this stream, Sinaiticus is uh, made on parchment, not paper. It's it's not parchment. It's made on, uh, I believe, vellum, I think. Basically, antelope skins. So that's going to be very important later on. Oh, let's see. I would love to have a few more people join us because what I'm seeing right now is that there's only one person watching. Um, if you're watching and you haven't commented yet, um, go right ahead and... Uh, and uh, uh, add a message to the chat. I'm not sure, but I think that this might be a subscribers only chat. So if you don't find yourself with the ability to uh, comment, you can hit the subscribe button and hop right in. Um, so yeah, spray arm has commented several times. I've commented a couple of times. I just hope that we're not just down to one person that wants to listen to me. <laughs> Our YouTube channel has been suffering, so please um, please consider sharing it. We've lost, I think, three subscribers. We're almost at 450 subscribers. Um, but yeah, we got up to 449 and then 448, and now we're at 447. So we're gradually losing followers. I'm not sure if it's because of these live streams and the, the horrible quality that they've had, or if it's me or i don't know i'm just hoping to uh, be able to pick this ball back up and uh, and keep running with it i'm watching or rather listening there's no video yes unfortunately i can't really do video at this point um um we have the fastest speed of internet for our area which i think is one gig or something like this so once I'm able to get a cable, hopefully by next week, um, and uh, fish it up around the ceiling and out to the, the kitchen area where our router is, then um, I should be able to do video after that. I've got my fingers crossed, so we'll see. And uh, thank you for joining us, Helga, Helgi Evanson. Not quite sure how to pronounce your um your first name. Helge? I'm not sure. That's my attempt. Okay. 
So, if Sinaiticus's pages were stained to make them look older, guess what that means? That means that textual criticism, every Bible that... <laughs> Thank you. Um... Oh, uh, let's see. Every Bible that has aligned itself to the Vatican Codex, every Bible that is based on the West Cotton Hort Greek text, everything that is based on the United Bible Society or Nestle Allen Greek texts, which are based off the West Cotton Hort critical theories and text, all of them need to be rewritten, reconsidered, scrapped, thrown out, back to the drawing board, start over. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are the only two Greek manuscripts that seem to carry any kind of weight in textual criticism, modern textual criticism, and it's very sad. The papyrus, oh yes, look at the papyrus. They're so old, so amazing, so obscure, so... But really, they don't do they don't do half of what Sinaiticus and Vaticanus did, and what they're continuing to do. Ah, <sighs> which is a shame because they're both probably modern codices, and they're being recognized as fourth century documents, which is sad. So, let's get into this darkening pages idea. David W. Daniels's playlist, something funny about Sinaiticus. Video 3, Who Darkened Sinaiticus? And I'm sorry about not being able to show graphics again. Pages. But who would do something like that? Or, logically speaking, who had to have either done it or been in partnership with whoever did it? It's unbelievable, but I don't see another option. And it sheds a harsh light on my education and even some of my own assumptions. Want to hear what I learned? Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. In my last video, Is Sinaiticus a Fake? I showed you how sometime during the 1800s, the huge codex, big book, that we call Codex Sinaiticus, was changed from white to stained and dark. Let's break that down a bit. I am indebted to the researcher Stephen Avery once again for, for his painstaking research. This time, in 1884 to 1850, all of Sinaiticus, meaning the so-called Septuagint Old Testament with embedded Apocrypha and including the New Testament plus the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas, every bit of it was clearly white, witnessed as white, described as white. Two sections of it were taken away, ultimately to the King of Saxony, that's in Leipzig in modern Germany. And anyone can see that the Codex Federico Augustanus, CFA for short, is white to this very day. Then Porfiry Uspensky of Russia saw what was left of it the next year and described it as white in 1845. Then he visited again in 1850. It was still white. He published that fact in his two books on his journeys published in 1856 and 1857. That covers 1844 to 1850, six or seven years. And maybe because Leipzig is right there in Germany People saw the CFA so white, and they thought the Sinaiticus, well, the whole Sinaiticus, was white as well. In 1910, the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, Bible and the Church, said, quote, the Sinaitic manuscript was wonderfully fine, snow-white parchment. And listen to this 1913 description by another writer, J.A. McClyman. Quote, Sinaiticus was rescued from oblivion by the famous critic Tischendorf and now lies 
in the library of St. Petersburg, that's Russia, it is written on snow white vellum, supposed to have been made from, from the skins of antelopes. So according to two authors, the Sinaiticus was what? Snow white. But there's just one problem. It wasn't. In point of fact, after 1859, it was actually dark. That is, after Tischendorf got hold of it. How do we know that? Since those later writers described it as Snow White. From Tischendorf himself. Listen, in 1862, Tischendorf described them as Surflafen. That's a Latin word that means yellowed. Also in 1862, Tischendorf allowed another scholar, Trigallus, to examine Sinaiticus for three days. So if it were changed after that date, Trigellus would have known it. 1864, Frederick Scrivener, in his own book, a full collation of the Codex Sinaiticus with the received text of the New Testament, said, quote, the vellum leaves were now almost yellow in color, end quote. And in 1911, Hallen and Kearsop Lake photographed the Sinaiticus in color, so there was no hiding what they saw. They said, quote, the thicker leaves are inclined to a yellowish tint. So people who actually saw the big part of the Sinaiticus thought it was yellow. Those who saw it before Tischendorf had it or only saw the CFA in Germany said it was snow white. And the CFA, which was quickly, 1844, sent to the king of Saxony in modern Germany, was and still is white. So why did people still think it was all white after Tischendorf published the Sinaiticus in 1862? My thought, people could see the CFA part in Germany. People could not see the rest all the way in Russia. People had no reason to doubt that the whole Sinaiticus looked the same. So whoever saw the Snow White CFA assumed it was all white, but those who saw the rest of the Sinaiticus that Tischendorf spent all that time with assumed it was all yellowed and dark with those stains. There were two sets of people writing about two colors of Sinaiticus at the same time. Interesting. And nobody even noticed because not until the last couple of years has anyone put all the known pieces of Sinaiticus together where we can see them with our own eyes. You can see. What does this tell us? There are only so many years between when we knew the Sinaiticus as a whole was white and when a large part of it became dark. 1884 to 1850, white. 1862, dark, but wait. Tischendorf got the big part of it in 1859. And remember, when he got the CFA, his story says he only got one third of what he saw. So if someone else had darkened it, Tischendorf would have known because it was part of the pages of the Bible he got in 1859. Then he could have cried foul. What are you doing destroying the most ancient text of the Bible? But he didn't. He had to have known that the Sinaiticus was actually snow white. He himself said he saw not just the 43 leaves, but another 86. Those were part of what he brought back from St. Catherine's Monastery in 1859. That means one of two things. One, it was darkened between 1850 and 59, and Tischendorf knew, but said nothing about it. Or two, it was darkened sometime after he got it in 1859, and he hoped no one would ever know it was white. So, either Tischendorf did it, or he knew who did it and was an accomplice. Tischendorf doesn't sound too good right now, does he? But let's look at it from a totally different angle. How does God deal 
with hidden things. Okay, so we're going to stop it right there. That's sad if we actually have zero people following us right now, because that's pretty huge. I, all I see are zero right now. If you are here and you are listening, it'd be encouraging to uh, see a comment. Nick, I totally agree. We need to scientifically test the, the ink and the material. Yes, we do. Because like with 2427, that was a manuscript that agreed very much with Vaticanus. In, it was a little gospel of Mark that was found in an attic in um, Athens, I believe. Um, a collector had bought it and died, and they found it. And they're like, oh, wow, look at this. It probably goes back to the 1300s or something like that. And wow, look at how much it agrees with Vaticanus and its readings. And it's got differences and things. And... And it turned out that it had Prussian blue and an aquamarine and titanium white in the illustrations that were underneath the text. Underneath the text. So the text can't be older than the images. The images and the colors in there were dated to no older then, like, what? The, like, 1820 or something like this? 1920? I forget. David Daniels gets into it in, into it in one of his videos in that playlist. I forget which one, though. So, yeah, that 2427 was... A huge deal because it agreed with Vaticanus until hmm, turns out it was a very, very modern book and it was copied from a printed edition of Vaticanus, a critical printed edition of Vaticanus. So not much of a witness to support Vaticanus anymore. That was hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. Wow, these these paleographers, these scientists. Wow, we need to trust them. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. I appreciate you being here. You're like, like the only guy that's... There. I don't know. We'll be weird together. All right, let's see. So much for what color is it? That's like a child's question. You would ask a kid. What color is this, Johnny? Is it white or is it yellow? Let me see. Who darkens on Yannickus? All right. Is the... Oops. That's coloring the truth. I need part four. Is the Sinaiticus origin a lie? And this is where we get into an author who uh, is writing about Sinaiticus from a a mainstream perspective that it is an ancient document and stuff like this. And he ends up expressing that the origins of Sinaiticus with his uh, his discovery of what? Like, uh, I don't know, like a third of it or something? I forget. Of... Uh, I'm sorry. Can I be distracted for one second? It's just kind of sad to see that this is the poorest performing live stream that we've done so far. And this is probably the strongest one. Because we're talking about the uh, the uh, possibility that Sinaiticus could be a 4th century document. We're looking at this from the perspective from from a perspective that's critical of of that viewpoint. We're analyzing that idea. 
the Tischendorf side of things. Whereas before, could it be an 18th century document connected with Simonides? Why would he make up such a story? And then this one is, why would Tischendorf make up such a story? I'm not sure what you need me to say again. I'm sorry. <sighs> you broke up after you said you guys. I'm... I don't know. It's 11 o'clock at night. I don't remember what I said. Uh, let's see. Coloring the truth. So this is the Sinaiticus origin. This is also by David W. Daniels. Um, he has not given me permission to play these on my YouTube channel, but I'm doing it anyways, and I'm sure that he doesn't mind. This 17 second morning ritual is one of the fastest. Oh, I'm sure to melt fat naturally. Wow. Okay. The simplest of questions give us the most interesting answers. Codex Sinaiticus is the Greek text that tipped the balance of the world's Bible text scholars away from the King James and Bibles like it to something called the critical text. It became one of the most important and most studied manuscripts of all time. Look, it even has its own web page. So we should be able to ask simple questions and get simple answers, right? Let's find out. Here's a child's question. What color is Sinaiticus? That's an interesting question. Because if it's white, if part of it is white, if any part of it is still white vellum or white parchment or whatever you want to call it, why is it still white? After, after, oh, <clears throat> if it's supposed to be from the fourth century, over a thousand years, like what? 1700 years years it's still white how it makes no sense at all and if the pages had to be stained in order to make it look old it was not one of the bibles from constantine it was not it was not one of the ones you know, it, it, it was not from the 400s. It couldn't be. It couldn't even be from the 1300s and still be that, that color. 1800s makes a little bit more sense. And we'll get into the story that uh, Tischendorf told here with um, David Daniels. It gets pretty interesting. Let's get back to it. The answer will bring you an embarrassing surprise. Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. First, I've got to thank Jack McElroy, author of the amazing book, Which Bible Would Jesus Use? for sending me his own Sinaiticus facsimile to check out for myself. And I got to thank Stephen Avery for his great research. We're doing a lot together. And Mark Mitchie for his work with the graphics. I am so amazed at what I'm going to show you. But let me tell you a story. Back in the 1800s, there was a guy named Constantin Tischendorf. He went out to discover ancient Bibles. The guy who helped pay for the trip was King Frederick of Saxony. So Tischendorf went down to the St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Peninsula and brought back two sections, 43 leaves, that he grabbed or cut out of an Old Testament. Then he gave those as a present to King Frederick and named them after him. People who finance your trip expect things like that. Right around that time, 1844-45, 
a couple of guys, including a religious guy named Porfiry Uspensky, saw the rest of the document and described it as snow white. And he took a few leaves back with him. And people went to Germany and again saw Frederick's leaves for themselves, snow white. 15 years later, Tischendorf came back with 347 other leaves. He held on to them a couple of months in Cairo while he and a couple of unnamed guys helped him. Now, in the 19th century, people were really into finding ancient documents. Sometimes they pay good money for them. So you can bet that faking documents to make them look ancient was a huge business. They'd stain the documents and they'd make them look darker and change the ink so it would look lighter and they'd rough up the paper or parchment and voila, a brand new ancient document. Well, after those two months with Tischendorf, in Cairo, he let others see this Sinaiticus, and guess what? It wasn't Snow White anymore. It was stained and darkened, and the ink was lightened, and the whole thing looked old now. What happened to the color? But that's not all. There's also sheets of Sinaiticus that are kept in libraries in the Egyptian peninsula, in Russia, in Germany, and 347 in England as well. But a few years ago, a number of scientists decided to use the internet to bring them all together. As complete a Sinaiticus as anyone has ever seen with high definition photos, they even used color bars to calibrate the pictures so they're color accurate. I got all 822 pictures on a single photo. Want to take a look? Even at this size, I bet you can tell the pages that are Frederick's apart from Tischendorf's. Now that's regular color. I added some shadows. See if you can see that better. Can you see the parts that are King Frederick's? How about if I added a little shine to it in addition? Does that make it clearer? Yeah. That's quite a difference, isn't it? You guys love to check out the See, video for that. Someone part. is being dishonest. It's called but there's a more. If you spend five hundred to eight hundred dollars, you can get a huge book with all the discovered pages of Sinaiticus. In fact, it says the images taken according to agreed technical standards were processed to represent faithfully the actual appearance of the pages. And then they were reduced by about 5%. Okay. It said they also made sensitive adjustments since the appearance of the parchment and ink varied somewhat between the leaves at the four libraries. Okay, so let me show you what they say Sinaiticus looks like. Ready? There. You see it? Do you see the difference? Neither do I. See, these pages look... Doesn't matter where I look. So let me ask you a really important question. What color is Sinaitic? Those same two pages I just showed you, this is with the color bars. If the scientists with the color bars are right, then there are some major color differences. But if they're right, then the publisher of that big book just might have photoshopped the color so that it was all the same pretty much. You just saw it with your own eyes. And so on that point, 
definitely go check this video out when you have a chance. It's called, oh, let's see. Is the Sinaiticus origin a lie? Question mark. That's part number four on his something funny about Sinaiticus playlist on the Chick Publications or Chick Tracts official YouTube channel. Um, let's see. Yeah, it would be nice if they actually did chemically test Sinaiticus for reals, not fooling around for real legitimate, you know, stuff. And having a YouTube channel, we're going to try to put any kind of pressure that we can on, uh, you know, because, you know, people people would love to see that because there's been a lot of controversy as to its age in uh, recent years. So let's, you know, let's 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 have it. Let's let's find out what's actually going on here. Let's see what's going on. Let's chemically test all of the manuscripts. How about that? Sound like a good idea. I think it's a good idea. Because if you start getting inks that were only available in the 1700s from underneath, you know, the writing or the inks that were used to write it and, you know, the parchment is so young and things like that. It's just like, well, how many ancient documents are you going to have left once we're all done with the forgeries? Um, or the ones that are just misidentified by people that think they can tell how old something is by the shape of letters. Let's see. So in this, he's got a printed edition of Sinaiticus, and he has the um, the photographs from online. Online, they're all yellowed, and then these ones are white, and then these ones are yellow. The color bars are consistent. They're taking pictures of the actual thing. If you saw them next to each other, they'd look just like they do on your screen. And then in the book, you go look at the book and all the colored, all the pages that were yellow, all of a sudden, oh, look at that. They all look ancient now. Hmm. I wonder if somebody was trying to sell a book. Publicly accessible pictures are not exactly, um, you know, they're not worth photoshopping. Those just tell the truth. Interesting. Then Tischendorf's 347 sheets were intentionally stained to make the papers and the ink look old. Ink, lighter, page, darker. One guy on the internet said, no, you're wrong. The Sinaiticus has been tested by hundreds of people. Nope. Not a single test has been done on the age of the parchment or of the ink. They were set to test it in April of 2015. Then they changed the guy over the project, and suddenly the testing was canceled. Why? What are they afraid they would find? Not the scientists, I mean. The powers that be. What are they afraid of finding out? That the Sinaiticus is actually not an ancient document after all? That it was a modern forgery that was faked to make it look old? That would explain why it's never been mentioned in any clear way anywhere until 1844. But Sinaiticus is the reason we took out the second yet in John 7, 8, making Jesus a liar. Sinaiticus tipped the balance so that we'd have the blind man believing in the son of man, not the son of God. It also took out the words, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him in John 9, 38, taking away that Jesus is God to be worshiped. Not even Vaticanus removes that one. And of course, Sinaiticus is the reason that we have <clears throat> these warning notes in the last 11 verses of most copies of the Gospel of Mark, including King James Bibles. Check out my Ryrie, for instance, saying we can't believe them. I'll have to give Mark 16 its own vlog, so don't worry about that. Okay. So I think, all right, so that is that. What video was that anyways? 
That was coloring the truth. Okay, here we go. I am so excited about the new option. I am so excited about being able to power everything with free electricity. If you ever believed someone, even for 30 years, and suddenly found out that he lied, and not just to others, but to you, his friend, and not just you, to his own brother and wife, it's devastating. It's astonishing. Okay, so this is going to get into the story that Konstantin Tischendorf told about his initial, the first time that he set eyes on pages of Sinaiticus. James White, who's like, King James only conspiracy nut jobs, don't pay any attention to them kind of thing. That's him. He's like, let me dispel the rumor that Sinaiticus was found in a trash can. That's ludicrous. It was brought to Constantine Tischendorf wrapped in a scarlet cloth. Oh, okay. Interesting. Well, when you go and read Constantine Tischendorf, he made like three trips to Mount Sinai. Well, Mount Sinai. St. Catherine's Monastery. First trip, he saw some leaves in a basket, apparently near a fireplace of some kind, I guess. And, uh, well, I don't want to steal David's thunder here. James White's like, oh, that's a crazy story. Don't believe it. It's like, well, if Constantine Tischendorf told you the story, is it just not recognized by scholars as the truth? He didn't tell the truth about how he found it? Okay. Well, then that means he lied about how he found it. Okay. Oh. So, yeah, we're going to get into this story. It's pretty fascinating how things are starting to turn. The tide is starting to turn against uh, textual criticism modern, scientific, good, godly, dedicated, scientific, textual criticism, so-called. Okay. This is what I found out just yesterday about Constantin Tischendorf, the guy who gave us the Sinaiticus, supposedly the oldest Bible in the world, the one they used to justify so many changes in modern Bibles. Want to learn what I just found out? Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. I got these books in the last few days. Uh, the one translated in 2013, and the other just came out this year. I got a digital copy. They are pro Tischendorf, no doubt about it. But between them, they are showing me that what Tischendorf claimed about how he got the Sinaiticus that I even passed on in my book, couldn't possibly have happened. In a book that he wrote three years before he died, he told about how he found the Sinaiticus manuscript. He was in a monastery library in the Sinai Desert, surrounded by shelves of printed and handwritten books. He said, I looked through them one by one. In the middle of the library, however, there was also a large basket containing the remains of damaged manuscripts. When I proceeded to examine this, Kirillos, the librarian, remarked that its contents had twice been thrown into the fire. This, therefore, was the third filling, which to all appearances was destined for the same end. I could not fail to be astonished when I removed a number of very large parchment sheets of Greek script whose paleographic appearance led me to conclude that they are of the greatest antiquity. Oh, yes. Well, that makes all kinds of sense because the, uh, what is that? Rome and uh, what was it? St. Catherine's? I think it was St. Catherine's was the other one, either that or it was Mount Athos, are like the two uh, biggest repositories of ancient Greek manuscripts in the East. Something like that. 
At least that's what I've heard. And they're just going to chuck the pages from an ancient, 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 ancient New Testament and Old Testament. Possibly the oldest ones in existence at the time. Possibly the most valuable manuscript. Second most valuable manuscript outside of the Vatican Codex to uh, modern textual criticism, which takes your Bible and takes all these little verses out of it that, of course, don't affect any doctrine. We'll get to that in later streams. They're just going to throw it out as though it's a piece of garbage. Hmm. Well, maybe the whole story is not true. That would make a little bit more sense to me. As in as as a lay person who prints designs takes pictures stuff like that and just sits here looks at the whole mess and just is like you know guys we could do better than this this is nuts i'll uh, let david continue paleographic means ancient writing a paleographer is someone who deciphers and transcribes ancient writing. A bit later, he wrote, The basket's destiny rendered it possible for the smaller, loose batch of leaves, 43 of them, to be surrendered to me at my request. So, there are four main points I want you to note from Tischendorf's own hand in his own book, 1871. One, there was a large basket with remains of damaged manuscripts. Two, Carillos, the librarian, told him that the last two basketfuls were thrown into the fire. Three, this basketful was the third filling, put there to be burned. Four, he got to take 43 leaves, later called the Codex Frederico Augustanus, CFA, because they were just going to be thrown into the fire. What if I told you that all four of these points were bold faced lies? Oh, how could you do that? Let me make it simple. On the very next page, the author explains. Okay, this is going to be interesting with the author explaining some things because, of course, you can't besmirch the name and character of the goodest, godliest man that ever went out and discovered ancient Bible manuscripts. The famous Bible hunter, the astute, the revered Constantine von Tischendorf. How dare you? You are slandering a brother in Christ. You are being the devil. You're a crazy conspiracy nut. Ever heard all that? Well, how about the guy that wrote the book that Daniel's reading from right now? I'm not sure, but I think he's actually reading from the Bible Hunter. Something like that. I forget which book he's reading from right now. But it's not your typical conspiracy right wing you know weird stuff and i'm telling you there's some weird stuff out there that's true that i'm being surprised by a lot this is it just it just keeps getting crazier guys i'm i'm working toward not working on it yet but i'm working toward an introductory a video slash audio clip thing to uh, bring our um to, to to introduce our streams. And I'm trying to think of what to bring in during that clip as interesting high points. Sound bites, I guess, from different people that speak along these lines. And uh, the difficulty that I'm finding 
is isolating it down to the real interesting heavy stuff. Isolating it down to, you know, four or five different things. Limiting limiting my uh, the different things that I bring up there. Because there's just so much and it just keeps getting deeper and thicker and crazier. And has anybody heard that conspiracy theories, listening to alternative media, that kind of stuff is illegal in Ireland now? Has anybody heard that? Guys, I'm telling you, pretty soon, and I mean, I would <laughs> I would download all the stuff that I could, but in America, I think that alternative media and so-called conspiracy theories, which are correct, are going to keep on getting suppressed more and more and more and more and more. And eventually, they'll just become illegal. I'm hoping that this channel won't be illegal because of that in some point in the future, future, future. There's a lot of channels that I enjoy that would fall very nicely into that category of conservative alternative media that deals with so-called conspiracy theories. Call it a conspiracy theory and get the person that's saying it to shut up. That's just the, the way to deal with things that you don't understand that you've never researched for yourself. Mark Ward more than willing and I don't I don't want to bash all these people I don't want to stir us up against them I don't want to be us versus them mentality but guys Mark if you're listening to this which I highly 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 doubt how can you say that Gail Ripplinger is a rabid conspiracy nut when you haven't even researched whether or not her claim is authentic. The one video that you did talking about, um, oh, David Daniels and, um, um, not, not David Daniels. Oh, what's the guy's name? Baker or something like that. He, he, uh, calls Gail Ripplinger about, uh, the definitions and strongs and the, the, the ASV and things like this. And Gail says that, he authored or helped author um, both of them. And that's why they're so similar. Immediately, Mark Ward jumps and says, conspiracy theory. And then later on, he admits that he actually doesn't know if there is a connection or not. That's sad. And I think it's irresponsible. For, for, and, and, and with how scholarly and fair he comes off as, that he can't just be like, you know, I don't know. Let's find out. Yeah, it always starts in California, then it comes to New York, and then it's just... Uh... And then, yeah. David Daniels is a conspiracy theorist, because... He doesn't agree with all of the scholars about Sinaiticus and how old it is. Oh, okay. Well, have all the scholars that you know done any research into this kind of stuff? Here's one that has. Are you going to listen to what he says? Here's the explanation on the next page from what David just read. One, that large basket wasn't a waste paper basket. For centuries, as Tischendorf knew, those baskets were the way you store parchment all over Europe and the East. Two, monks did not throw parchment into the fire. Parchment is nothing but thinly scraped animal hide, which burns badly, and it would stink up the place. Besides, parchment was valuable. Papyrus can get old and fall apart. Parchment is, according to this author, almost imperishable. 
They didn't destroy it. They reused it. You know how? They scraped or washed off the old words and wrote on new words. Then it was called a palimpsest. And Tischendorf knew this as well. Tischendorf, it turns out, became famous among paleographers when he deciphered a Bible palimpsest called Ephraimi Rescriptus. Three, so this couldn't have been the third villain waiting to be burned at all. Four, so he didn't get those 43 snow white leaves, the CFA, because it was just going to be burned. But that leads us to a fifth line. Tischendorf lied about what Carillus the librarian said. He couldn't have said that they were burning parchment. He couldn't have said two other basketfuls of parchment were burned. He couldn't have given Snow White CFA to Tischendorf to save it from the fire. But that's not all I just found out. Just last night, reading this book, I found out that Tischendorf wrote letters with parts of this story to his older brother, to others, and to his future wife. What kind of man would lie to everyone he knew? Look, I thought Tischendorf made some pretty big mistakes. But I never thought the story of how he got Sinaiticus was a lie. And if that's a lie, what else is? Do you know what depends upon Sinaiticus? Matthew 5.22, taking the without a cause, making Jesus a sinner for being angry at the money changers. What tipped the balance for removing those words? The Sinaiticus. John 7, verse 8, changing I go not up yet to this feast to I go not up to this feast, changing not yet to not, making Jesus a liar to his brothers. Even the Vaticanus got that one right. But the Sinaiticus is the reason that it was changed in 22 modern Bibles, making Jesus a sinner, and Jesus a liar, from the Codex Sinaiticus. This find of the century, as they call it the Sinaiticus, overnight changed Tischendorf into a superstar. Scholar Philip Schaff, in his 1883 Companion to the Greek New Testament, he talked about Tischendorf's, quote, personal vanity, and over fondness for his many and well-earned titles, covering 10 lines on the title pages of some of his books, and 20 or more decorations from sovereigns which were displayed in his parlor, end quote. That included, by the way, honorary doctorates from Oxford and Cambridge and a commendation from the Pope. None of that fame and Fortune could be the motivation for lying for 30 years to everyone who knew about the origin of the Sinaiticus, could it? I found this out from his other new biography. In 1866, four years after he published Sinaiticus, he said these words, quote, but we have at last hit upon a better plan than this, which is to set aside this Textus Receptus altogether, and to construct a fresh text derived immediately from the most ancient and authoritative sources. Who's we? And did he really mean to set aside the preserved Bible, the Bible of the persecuted believers, the King James Bible, and his own Lutheran church? Yes. He did. Brothers and sisters, this is no small thing. Remember, every Bible you see behind me and their Bible down in footnotes, including in the King James's, and every Bible translated by Wycliffe Bible Translators and SIL and the United 
Bible societies in every language around the world is largely based on the changed text in Sinaiticus. Seriously, count the cost. I already have, and I have never regretted a second of it. God bless you, and have a wonderful day. So yeah, that's that. And that whole thing about um, uh, Christ saying that he wasn't going to go yet up to the feast, and then as soon as they're gone, he heads there. It's like, yeah, that's if if that's how the Bible is supposed to read, that's sounds just like Jesus was lying for convenience sake. That's what it sounds like to me. And it sounds like Constantine Tischendorf is lying for convenience sake, for fame, fortune, or whatever. Let's see. There's a lot of other things that I could bring up right now. Which part of scripture wasn't bad either? Let's see. I would like to bring up the uh, Kalinikos letter, though. So let me see if I can find that really quick. So let's go to... Untold Bible Story... And then the Me and the Tears Among the Wheat video. For nearly 2,000 years. Okay. On the world, a new manuscript as an old one. Here we go of Kalinikos bear within them an almost prophetic warning about the codex a script in a rubbish basket so where would the burned pages of the manuscript have come from is it possible that Tischendorf burned parts of them to de destroy the markings of Simonides as Kalinikos suggests Okay, so that harkens back to the last few uh, live streams. And this might explain why he came up with a story about the monks throwing the pages into the fire later on, a story which nobody really seems to believe. Interesting. Nobody seems to believe his story that he wrote to his family. Hmm. Good old godly, um, apparently um, lying Tischendorf. So I guess if you're going to get famous, and if you're going to find uh, the manuscript that is going to back up the Vaticanus for Westcott and Hort to be able to give Vaticanus the precedence in all things, and if you're going to find the world's oldest Bible prerequisite is is that you have to have no problem with and the ability to lie your face off so i don't know guys i'm listening to this stuff and i listen to the james white debate with chris pinto Maybe Chris didn't always have the best points. Maybe James White brought up a couple of good points about how the papyri includes some of Sinaiticus's um, unique readings and things like that. But that's not history. That's 
we haven't we don't have a manuscript that does blah 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 and this and this one do this and 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 how do you explain you know things like that we suppose that oh this may have you know theories based on a text um one thing that i didn't i didn't catch where um oh, we should go through that video at some point where um david daniels goes through it's in that playlist i highly recommend like i said before listening to that playlist something funny about sinaiticus and it gets into a a lot more as far as the text goes where the text itself limits itself so that the manuscript can only be as old as the 1300s and no older Sinaiticus, that is. So, yeah, let's keep listening to Chris Pinto's thing and um, get another live stream in the bag. Kalinikos claimed that he himself had been at St. Catherine's Monastery when Tischendorf was there. And that Tischendorf took the first pages of the manuscript without permission. He said, I further declare that the codex which Dr. Tischendorf obtained is the identical codex which Simonides wrote, inasmuch as I saw it in the hands of Tischendorf and recognized the work. Okay, that was in the Journal of Sacred Texts. I missed the reference on that. Kalinikos also claimed that the manuscript had been washed with lemon juice and herbs to weaken the appearance. Okay, source is Codex Sinaiticus and the Simonides Affair by uh, J.K. Elliott, page 77 to 78. So he's talking about the uh, Kalinikos claims. Appearance of the letters and to give it a more ancient look. Washed with lemon juice. In response to these accusations, the supporters of Tischendorf insisted that Simonides had forged the letters himself, and they claimed that Kalinikos was a fictional character. Okay, so let this sink in. He had to have made it up. Either Kalinikos was an actual person telling lies, or it was Simonides who was writing, or somebody else that he knew was writing making lies 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 so if simonides now so, something like like james white points out in the debate uh, uh truth was not uh, the essential element of truth did not form a part of his character or something like this okay apparently from what we've seen tonight it didn't form an essential part of uh, tischendorf's either And on top of that, somebody had to invent Kalinikos. If Kalinikos was a real person who was telling the real truth of what he really saw, then there's your second witness, and you better look into this, bub, as they say. As Wolverine would say, bub. You better start looking into this history and do a little bit of studying. Because it ain't over till it's over. Yet in his book, James Farrar tells us that Kalinikos was indeed a real person and that his letters cannot be brushed aside as the testimony of a fabulous being. Yet the letters of Kalinikos bear within them an almost prophetic warning about the Codex. He wrote to the newspapers in 1862 that you will greatly sin in foisting on the world a new manuscript as an old one, and especially a manuscript containing the Holy Scriptures. Injury to the church must accrue from all this even from the evidently 
numerous corrections of the manuscript. Ah, oh, I didn't nail it. Okay. If you guys, if, if anybody who is listening to this video has not read The Word God Will Keep It by Joey Faust yet, read it and weep. The 400-year history of the King James Bible only movement. It's incredible. It has quotes from the 1600s on about the King James Bible being God's word, how people have believed about it, and how it's been attacked. How it's been Catholics, Unitarians, and occultists all the way up until modern modern times. Last century or so, it started becoming occultists, Unitarians, Catholics, and Protestants, and Baptists. And uh, what they said before the RV came out was, you guys, what you're doing in revising the Bible is going to destroy the world. Infidelity is going to ride high, high-handed, in power, and the church, Christians, will not have the weapon that they've had for century after century. You guys think you're doing a good thing, but you're not. You're going to hurt everyone doing this. That's what Kalinikos just said. Don't foist a new manuscript upon the world as though it's an old manuscript. You can't do that without doing an awful lot of harm, especially when it's a Bible manuscript. Tischendorf originally documented some 14,800 corrections. Today, the Codex Sinaiticus has its home at the British Library in London. In 2009, they finished the Codex Sinaiticus project, which was aimed at fully examining Tischendorf's famous manuscript. In 2008, we interviewed Dr. Juan Garces, one of the curators. Okay, let me see if I can find the next part that I need. Where Kalinikos talks about Tishy. There's the Beauty of Books clip. Faithlessness. I have proclaimed the truth, for I will answer as I should to the all seeing God in the day of judgment. Therefore, I have spoken. I have no sin. Holy yours, Constantine Simonides. Simonides would publish a final work in 1864 before leaving England for good. In it, he reaffirmed his claims about Sinaiticus and included the testimonies of those who believed him. Yet his enemies in the press continued to insist that he was merely a liar and a forger. The charge of forgery was never proven against Simonides, but can be traced to his initial conflict with Tischendorf at the University of Leipzig in 1854. The scholars of Western... In fact, if you study what happened when Trigellus, for example... Yeah. When he goes to I'm having a hard time finding it. Originally been written in Greek, but nobody had ever found a Unitarian movement going on at that time in in the Anglican Church, and that was the Ang. Christ's flock is one, but there are many folds. We Rome in into Western Europe, and that's very important. <laughs> yeah. Not cooperating. 
So I'm going to see if I can... See if I can drag around in my um in the copy of it. Matthew fragment. German students in English libraries. Brighton Observer, Literary Churchman. Because I haven't had a chance to do what I wanted to do, which was look up the full quote based on its text so that I would have more context to this quotation, but there's a part in here where Clinico starts talking about Tischendorf and he calls him like basically a child of Satan. It's really interesting to think about. He made his assertion public that the codex, and I guess it may have been written by himself. Tischendorf and the learner of Germany refused to recognize the claims of Simonides and continued his publication. Things went on this way, some persons believing Simonides, some Tischendorf. When suddenly, here we go, I think. When suddenly a Greek Archimandrite, who wrote the English papers from Alexandria, corrobor corroborating the statements of Simonides. It's December 26, 1862, the Brighton Observer. was a friend of Simonides, whose name was Kalinikos. Kalinikos wrote a series of letters to the English newspapers, confirming the story of Simonides and denouncing Tischendorf, whom he called the master and pupil of all guile and all wickedness. The master and pupil of all guile and all wickedness. Wow, that's that's quite a quite a thing to call somebody the master and pupil of all guile and all wickedness. In one of his letters, published in the literary churchman, Clinicos wrote, "I repeat." Clinicos wrote in the literary churchman, "I repeat that the manuscript in dispute is the work of the unwearied Simonides and of no other person." A portion of this was secretly removed from Mount Sinai by Professor Tischendorf in 1844. Secretly removed. The rest was inconceivable with inconceivable recklessness. He mutilated and tampered with according to his liking in the year 1859. I believe that fits David Daniels' timeline. Some leaves he destroyed, especially such as contained the acrostics of Simonides.
Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. So, let's shift gears real quick. Hopefully, we can finish this up shortly. I don't know about Konstantin von Tischendorf. I don't know about him. He apparently described, uh, he discovered like more ancient Greek manuscripts than almost any other person, which is interesting because you describe, you, you, you discover a lot of Greek manuscripts. That's kind of sus, you know. Are you really discovering these man or you got a you got a room with a black cloth over it full of ancient parchment? So let's see what the other side has to say about. Sinaiticus. Manly P. Hall, Horizon, the magazine of useful and, and, and intelligent living. 1946, quote, The Codex Sinaiticus is a manuscript of the 4th century. This was in 1946. So, not even no, around 100 years or so after it was discovered, so-called. This manuscript is one of the great books of the world. And although it was discovered long after the publication of the now universally accepted King James Version of the Bible, it is sufficiently important to justify considerable revision of our popular conception of the scriptural writings. End quote. Very, very interesting. And this is from Carl W. Mason, quote, I remember distinctly the shock that I experienced when the first time, uh, experienced the first time the revision published in common English as it is spoken today was shown to me. It seemed positively sacrilegious. To me, the wording and peculiar language of the old game King James Version seemed to be part of the Bible itself, and I was sure that I could never part with those old associations. That feeling has long since changed, however, and I have come to know that the newer translations are the best and most accurate. I survived the translation... Wait, sorry. I survived the transition from my old ideas, and am better for it today. So it is ever in the history of progress, and so it will be with, um, and so it will be with us as we advance the work of pushing masonry ahead in the van of human progress. Hmm. I should go through, um, I don't know if I can pull it up right now, but if I can pull up my PDF of the word God will keep it, it might be interesting to see where it mentions manuscripts. Fost audiobook. We'll keep it by Joy Faust. I like StreamYard. I like StreamYard very much because if it glitches or whatever, I can come right back to it. And it's not like YouTube where I can't do anything. Alrighty, let's see what we can do. And, um... For those of you that have uh, followed this thing for a little while, 
I've mentioned um, the Dean Show before, which I believe is a Muslim program of some such shape or other. And they had a guy on there who I believe went to Liberty University, a bigger guy, kind of looked like Santa Claus, great big beard. And one of the things that he said about why he converted to Islam is because when he was at when he was at Liberty, no pun intended, they talked about how the Sinaitic and Vatican manuscripts are the best and the oldest and all this stuff, and how awful these texts really are and how inconsistent the manuscript tradition was at that point and how different it was from the Bible that has been accepted for a long time, namely the King James Bible, and how it was being used to make modern translations and all this stuff as they're examining it. He's just like, wow, I don't believe the Bible anymore because there's no way that this could be God's word. It is so screwed up. Looking at the oldest manuscripts, it is completely obvious. And regardless of what James White says, there are people, real people, who are looking at ancient manuscripts today and are looking at the Bibles that they have right now. And they're just like, wow. The Bible's not what I thought it was. I guess it's not as important as I used to think. Okay, let's see. Page six of the PDF. You guys can pick up the PDF at cardcarryingchristians.com slash the word where we get into um, the book by Joey Faust on the word God will keep it. One moment, please. All right, so page six. Um, and you guys can pick it up there for free. And um, if you guys want, you guys can also offer a uh, donation for whatever you think it's worth. That's your option. Let's see. Hall praised the Greek manuscripts that modern versions are based upon as the greatest books in the world. Quote, the enthusiastic jot and tittle worshiper, namely people like King James only conspiracy theorists like myself, will insist that the words of the King James Version are the words of God himself. But every statement contained in the Bible should be checked with the Greek and Hebrew originals. The oldest existing codices of the New Testament reveal considerable change and amendment. The King James Version omits a number of passages. The Bible student is not justified in accepting the King James Version as an infallible production. End quote. Manly P. Hall, How to Understand Your Bible, 1942. <clears throat> D.A. Carson, King James Version Debate, A Plea for Realism, 1979. Quote, <clears throat> All this sounds alarming. If not two manuscripts agree, how can we know that the Holy Spirit inspired the New Testament authors to write? The matter is, on the face of it, very difficult. All agree that one sim cannot simply take the oldest manuscripts and trust them. I should pause and set at rest the troubled concern of anyone who on the basis of what I have written so far, concludes that the manuscript tradition is entirely unreliable or that we cannot really be certain of any of it. So, calm down, guys. We can be certain of some of it, 
Calm down, guys. It is reliable. Oh, okay. Interesting. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the race just do? When Christians are taught that various verses are not found in the most reliable early manuscripts and such like, how can they truly prepare themselves for the spiritual battle and fight the good fight of faith? 1 Corinthians 14.8 If a trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Modern, <clears throat> quote, um, the modern English um, and American revisions have the advantage of the most recently found manuscripts, the latest scholarship, and uh, par and uh, paragraphed printing. But one can rest content that the old common version is the most remarkable bit of translation ever done. In it, we have the very word of God in plain English, a sufficient guide for daily life. That's from page 27. Mm. And then there's a quote about the Christian school at Alexandria producing Armin or Arianism. Um, but is that evidence to be seen only in the original Hebrew and Greek texts? Since the original manuscripts are now lost, do 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 do. trying to see oh this is from the jehovah's witnesses the earlier the manuscript the more likely it is to be correct many other translations have found af, uh, have followed after the king james version keeping pace with the evolving languages older manuscripts have been found and uh, knowledge of greek and hebrew has been increased making possible more accurate translations a noteworthy illustration is the American Standard Version of 1901, and that's apparently from Equipped for Every Good Work, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, 1946. In the above book and other publications, they consistently attempt to correct the King James Version of the Bible with the American Standard Version, and they praise the Vatican and Sinaitic manuscripts. For example, notice their praise for the new versions in regard to 1 John 5, 7. This is interesting. Next looms up that text so often quoted by Trinitarians, 1 John 5, 7, according to the King James Version of the Bible. It does not appear in the old manuscripts, Vatican, Sinaitic, and Alexandrian, or Alex Alexandrine. All modern versions rightly omit the spurious text. The modern and accurate American Standard Version Bible correctly renders this portion, or uh, correctly renders this portion of the epistle. And that's from the same reference. And there's a great long length, lengthy quote um, provided by David Cloud from Frank Logston about the scriptures, the people speaking of the oldest manuscripts, they usually mean A, B, and Sinaiticus. I really want to get into the Joey Foss book. That would make a uh, a good collection of videos, I believe. Jack Chick from 85. Hmm. 
Okay, so I'm going to get to... I could have swore that the spiritualist... The same as Peter Jealous. That the spiritualist actually quoted the um, Sinaiticus as the great old version. Hmm. 1897, James Anthony Froud. The authority of the translation was the first to be taken. Then variation in the manuscript destroying confidence in the original texts. If the original language was miraculously communicated, there was no natural presumption that it would be miraculously... Uh, there was a natural presumption that it would be miraculously preserved. As it has not been, the inference of doubt extends backward on inspiration. How can the Protestant Church establish its claim that any inspiration of the Bible itself, when it is known that there is are no autographs of the Bible extant? And that is from H.M. Tabor, Faith or Fact, quoting uh, Froud. There's a lot going on in Joey Foss's book. I highly recommend that you guys pick it up. And then we have the quote by Manly P. Hall again. Lightfoot, how we got the Bible. Um, let's see. Westcott and Hort were fathers or at least popularizers of the modern critical text of which new Bible versions are derived. New versions are largely based upon the work and theories of Westcott and Hort, which that text at that point in time, the, uh, you know, Vatican shorter text is, um, it was more the property of liberals at that point in time. And uh, that came over from uh, Germany to England and Westcott and Hort picked it up. Your conservatives now accept that stuff, which is funny because the conservatives back then didn't have anything to do with it. It was the property of liberals back then, and now the old liberals are the new conservatives. Quote, it is scarcely possible to overstate the significance of this new Westcott and Hort text. Their achievement was revolutionary. The Westcott Hort text represented an acknowledged dependence on Sinaitic and Vatican manuscripts. There have been, of course, other editions of the Greek text since Westcott Hort. However, time has but confirmed their immense contribution to the status of our New Testament text, end quote. And that's Neil R. Lightfoot, How We Got Our Bible by Baker Books, 2010. And then guess what? Spiritualism of Johannes Gerber. Uh, what's his face? Stringer mentions this guy. One final spiritualist should be mentioned. Johannes Gerber, 1876 to 1944, was a Roman Catholic priest who became a spiritualist. In 1932, he authored Communication with the Spirit World, Its Laws and Its Purpose. And in 1937, he produced the New Testament, a new translation based on the oldest manuscripts. Gerber claimed that his translation was authored by spirits. The, based on the oldest manuscripts. Oh, yes, the oldest manuscripts, which means I translated Westcott and Hort's text, which means I translated their opinions based on Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and completely ignoring the translations, the ancient translations, and completely ignoring the uh, patristic witness. He adopted the view that the Bible only uh, condemns communications with evil spirits. Oh, 
That's right. I'm communicating with good spirits. You ask them, do you walk in the light? And, oh, okay, they're, they're good then. Um... trying to see if I can find anything particularly pithy. And uh, Phil Stringer talks about this a little bit, too. Um, the Watchtower's New World Translation is therefore inspired by evil spirits, the same class of spirits that inspired Westcott and Hort and the new versions that are based on their work. A careful comparison of the New World Translation, the NIV and NASB, etc., reveals that these versions share many of the same heretical readings, e.g., and then it goes into Matthew 17, 21 to Revelation 111. You guys can check that out on page 180 of the PDF. So let me give you that dialogue real quick that I referred to earlier. Um, observe the following words from Sacred Circle, 1855, which is a magazine edited by Judge Edmonds mentioned previously. Skeptic, quote, you are very severe upon the sacred word. Spiritualist, quote, I respect it as much as you do and believe that a thorough investigation cannot harm it. It is only when you claim too much for it, when you have the ver uh, the when you have every translated word of King James's version infallible. I don't like King James onlyism. Skeptic. What would you have us do? We would have nothing uh we have nothing but King James's version of the Bible, and wherever the English language is spoken, it is the authority. Must I become an oriental linguist, a perfect hebraist before I read my Bible? Spiritualist. No, but those who have studied those languages and thrown light upon the dark mysteries of the ancient record should be listened to. Judge Edmonds, Dr. Dexter O.G. Warren, The Sacred Circle, Volume 1, 1855. Joy Foss's comment, It can be clearly seen that the old serpent seeks to seduce people away from the clarity and certainty of the King James Bible. His light is the same lie that he offered to Eve after he attempted or after he tempted her to doubt the certainty of God's words. One of the most incorrect versions. This is all from this chapter called The Most Hated Book. Ay 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 guys. I I I posted a little while ago about Phil Stringer's uh um his speech that he gives about the um oh occultism and stuff like that. Versus the King James Bible. It's in my, uh, if you go to the YouTube channel and go to the community page, um, or community tab, I guess, and you scroll down, you should find it probably about a month ago. And uh, he talks in there about how, I believe it was Westcott, would, uh, you know, go into the church late at night that he, uh, bishoped in and he would sit there until someone would show up out of thin air maybe some dead saint or other and uh, he'd wait till another one came in and another and another just appeared and he would sit there Apparently, he would just sit there seeking advice. I don't know. I would love to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> Not that I would ever remote view, but that would be interesting to view remotely. And then when they would start to leave... 
he'd wait until they were all gone, and then he would leave himself. And like Phil Stringer says, you know, either that's true, or, or no, either he's lying, and, and I don't trust him with the Bible, or he's crazy, and I don't trust him with the Bible, or he's telling the truth, and I really don't trust him with the Bible. When he says that that kind of stuff happened. Oh, no, 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 you you crazy, you crazy, you King James-only conspiracy theory, whack jobs. Got it, got it, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, guys, I tell you what. The Sinaiticus thing just keeps on looking worse and worse and worse for the Constantine, Tischendorf, White, Ward, uh, you know, that the, the, the modern version crowd. Just keeps looking worse and worse and worser. I think this was the last week that I was planning to talk about this. Let me double check my notes. You guys, if you have any questions at all or comments or anything, you guys can leave those in the chat right now or you can comment later on. I will see your comments and I will respond to the best of my ability. Um, if you're new, please uh, consider hitting the subscribe button below this video and smash the like button if you enjoyed it. We are not done. We uh, will revisit this, I'm sure, in the future as more information comes to light. We're not going to leave this alone. I am pursuing this channel the best that I can. And as I've said before, if the channel falls through based on any of my shortcomings or anything else, if I fail this channel and I fail you guys, it's not because there wasn't more than enough information available about these things. Even if you are subscribed, please... Check to make sure that you are subscribed and that you've rung the not notification bell for all notifications so that the YouTube algorithm, algorithm does not decide that you don't need to hear about some of our videos that we put out. We got a lot in the works. Still trying to figure out a lot of things. Next week's live stream, just so you guys are aware a little bit. If you guys have any additional information that you guys can bring to this, all sorts of uh, possibilities with this next topic, May 19th, we are planning to talk about whether or not the uh, Mark of the Beast is supposed to be 666 or 616. Because apparently, that's a debate because there's two manuscripts that have 616. So, what's the deal? As far as I'm aware, it was a typo. And that's at least what the, uh, the, the disciples of the apostles wrote. I'm looking forward to jumping into that one and learning more. And hopefully on June 2nd, you guys won't want to miss... Um, I will try to uh, set up this live stream as early as I can and uh, get a list together for you guys. I'm planning, if all goes well according to schedule, I'm hoping to do a library tour on June 2nd where I will take you guys through all of the books that I've got Um Possibly play a recording that I make ahead of time. We shall see. We shall see how I'll be able to swing that one. But hopefully by that point we'll be able to do video. We'll have the cable, we'll have the adapter, and all that stuff will be great. Like I've said before, 
if you guys want to send, if you guys want to send uh, Gail Ripplinger a message that you appreciate her or a donation or a picture of you and your family or a GIF or whatever you want to do, um, the links in the description for that, I believe. It's her Mother's Day card, the digital Mother's Day card that we send to her uh, for uh, special um, special days. And, um, yeah, if you want to join our Facebook group, that's Bible Version Conspiracy is the Facebook group. There's also a messenger group that you can ask to join. And the Friends of Gail Ripplinger group and King James Visual Artists, if you have that artistic flair. Let's see. And, yeah, if you want to support us on a monthly basis or in any kind of way financially... Go right ahead. I appreciate it. More of you guys have stepped up to do that than I hoped for. Two is more than I hoped for. We will see what the future holds. Um, but like I've said, all the, the link's in the description for that. Buymeacoffee.com slash Joseph Armstrong. Or like I've said, best two ways that you guys can support this channel is with your prayers and your shares. So yeah, I appreciate you guys being here. Have a great night.